Uh, I'm Tyler Sigman. I'm the co-founder, co-president, design director, um, trash man, I don't know, whatever. It's a small company, so we all do a lot of things. Uh, Red Hook Studios. Um, when I was putting this talk together, so it's a postmortem. we're going to try to cover things that went well, things that didn't go so well. Um, but as putting the talk together, in particular, I think on the what went wrongs, uh, I'm going to focus a lot on one thing, not because there is difficulty in finding lots of, there's no hubris of in difficulty in finding lots of things that went wrong, but I think there's just a couple of things that were more interesting, so hopefully you'll forgive. It's not an exact standard five and five, like the old uh, GD Mag format. So Darkest Dungeon uh, is a turn-based gothic horror light fantasy RPG about the psychological stress of adventuring. And this is, we throw this screen up the minute you start up the game uh, to make sure you know what you're getting into. And of course, no one reads it because no one reads tutorials. But this gives us the ability to come back later and say, we told you it was, it was going to be bad. And this is what it looks like in practice. Survival is a tenuous proposition. That's okay, come on, healer. Sprawling tomb. Come on! So that's Ezekiel uh, 3. He actually uh, still likes us <laughs> and did play Darkest Dungeon after that and has actually played it since. Um, and so, yeah, that's nice. So he has gotten some more enjoyment out of the game. One of the things we set out to do with Darkest Dungeon that, that made it unique is, is trying to create emotional attachment. So I think we succeeded. Um, sometimes maybe not exactly in the ways that we, we planned. I mean, I wouldn't say that was like one of our design goals. <clears throat> But when we were coming up with the game idea, so Chris Brasso was originally his idea, uh, Chris and I were friends, and we, we would get together and talk about working on games together. We had worked at other studios in the past. Um, and this one kept, just it had so much weight. Every time we would talk about it, we'd get excited. And the main thing is we're, we're RPG fans, and there's so many great RPGs out there. I've been playing them my whole life, you know, on and off the computer. And one of the things we were really conscious of is just that, you know, we didn't want to just make an RPG because we love them. We wanted to ma make an RPG only if there was something maybe different or new that we could add that might make it stand out. And the, the real concept here is the idea of heroes are human. And, and Chris liked to say it's about the sword arm, not the sword. It's not how big your shoulder pads and giant uh, glowing sword are. It, it's, it's the human wielding it and how willing they are and able to fight. And so along with that, you know, becomes the whole range of, of human emotion. So moments of despair, these uncomfortable decisions we're putting you in as the player, uh, confronting you with loss and permanent consequences. And, but the real secret is we're not actually sadists. The moments of despair, they're only insofar as to create moments of triumph. Because what, what is an act of true heroism without the possibility of cowardice? And we felt like a lot of RPGs are all about heroism. You have one hit point, you're fighting the dragon, whatever. Hang in there, oops, didn't go well, reload, try again. A little bit about my background, uh, because it's relevant to what's next, is, is uh, I've designed a bunch of games on and off the computer, and a bunch of different genres. I like to say every time I make a game I enjoy, I have to do penance and make a racing game, um, which I do not enjoy, and am not particularly good at. 
but I think that diverse range of just you know non-collectible card games to weird hybrid um, action straticade games to turn-based really helped because Darkest Dungeon has a ton of systems in it. It's a small game made by a small team. You know, you look at something like The Witcher 3, it's kind of ridiculous for me to say there's this big scope to the game, but I think there was unexpected scope. The main pillars, I guess you could say, of the play experience are this town, exploration, combat, and camping. And we talked a lot up front about how much time should the player spend in each of these phases. Um, you know, combat by far is, I think, well, combat and exploration together are the lion's share of your time. But that's not to minimize the importance of the time you spend in camping. Or some people spend an awful lot of time in town looking at their things and, you know, putting their guys into treatment. But generally, you're walking side to side through a hallway finding things. Built around those, those four cores, though, are a ton of systems. And one of the challenges of the game was that a lot of these systems are... Um, Innovations, I guess, which is not trying to say that always worked, but the affliction system, uh, you know, was the real hook of the game. That, that was something, you know, it's, it's like, how do we psychologically model uh, these heroes? Meanwhile, the cost of entry making an RPG, you still have to do all the other things. Combat, leveling, quests, monsters, you know, all these, all these sorts of things. And so when you start layering in affliction system and torchlight, you know, some innovations, it, it was a lot at times. So I think one thing that went well is that you know, a lot of the systems are not particularly eloquent. Um, some of them certainly deserve a second pass, a third pass uh, that maybe never got it. And some of them are outright clunky. But together, it all worked. And, you know, sometimes, I guess, I say it went well because it's just a great sigh of relief for me that some of this, you know, it felt like at times that any one system that didn't do its job was just going to ruin the whole mix. Um, you know, like you're over-seasoning the stew and then, oh, it's, it's too, I can't recover it now. But I, I think in this case, um, one of the things you know I'm just most proud of in the game is is just that it did all hang together, duct tape and bailing wire and chewing gum and the whole bit, um, to support the goal of the game, which was this heroes are human. And part of that too, it's really important what we didn't do uh, it, for all those systems that we you know that I just showed. There was a lot that we wanted to put in, and these are just a couple of them. Um, crafting, or the idea of of a more meaningful upgrade system, a more meaningful gear or loot system. Um, you know, the, the characters have this armor and weapon progression. It's just linear progression. You can go from level one upgrade to level five in armor, level one to level five in weapon. You have two trinket slots. And, of course, we could have done a whole bunch more. We could have done paper doll, you know, et cetera, et cetera. But that would have taken away, especially with our team and, you know, with the budget that we had set out to make the game with, if I was spending time on that, I wouldn't have been spending time on the affliction system. And that would have been a mistake. Uh, similarly... And, you know, this, this was led really strongly by Chris, the creative director, is our focus on emergent narrative meant that we weren't doing these other cost of entry RPG features like extensive dialogue trees, you know, going into the abbey, talking to the abbot before you commit treatment, like, hello, Mr. Abbot, what's new today? What rumors have you heard? Um, none of that. The quests are not particularly in depth. You know, they're, they're kind of the equivalent of go get the 10 wolf pelts. Um, and we really avoided heavy lore at every possible opportunity. And that, that, was, uh, that was a creative choice, but all these also support kind of what we were trying to do. Um, we, we, you know, your ancestor called you to the estate, and you need to go to the weald and fight things, or the ruins. You know, it's, it's very archetypal, but in doing so, that means you have to construct a lot of story in your head. And ultimately, what we wanted to do, what we... You know, we're really after is the idea of kind of like these old roguelikes where you, you make your character and you go on these crazy adventures and then you can string together this story of like, well, I, that time with all the slugs in level 10 was rough. I barely got out of that. Thank God I drank the random potion and polymorphed and got away. Uh, we wanted you to do that with the heroes. And so the more that we force fed down your throat, that wouldn't have worked. So it was, it was very important for us not to do things. Um, our design process also went well. Yeah, you're welcome. Uh, Chris, so, you know, I'm the designer on the game, design director, but there's a lot to do with this game, and a lot of design, and a lot came from Chris um, and I working together very early. And this isn't always the role. I've filled on every game. It's kind of funny. But in this game, it, be it very much became this role of Chris, you know, drawing all day long and having time to think, because he can draw and think at the same time. I cannot spreadsheet and think about anything else at the same time. Um, and so he'd just be spouting ideas, you know. And, well, okay, not always spouting. He carefully thought of something. And, and you know, I, I kind of got into this role of, like, batting stuff back over the net. Um, 
And then sometimes he'd really, really, really want to talk about it again, bat it back over the net. And, you know, I could sit with it and get comfortable where it might have gone. Um, in fairness, also, my role in the game was was to wrangle all these things and then do the detail design. Like, okay, afflictions. Okay, how does that work? You know, how are we doing stress? What triggers an affliction? What kind of things can they do in the affliction? But um, kind of managing that whole cloud of red stuff was was at times just completely maddening, but also fun. And the creative direction of the game, having that established really strong up front, was what we needed to be able to resist that design feature creep. I mean, I think, you know, I'm a designer, and it's we all make games and it's really hard sometimes you wake up and have a shower and you think of this awesome thing you'd like to throw in and maybe it goes into the game and sometimes you got to resist the temptation and then also don't want to minimize the rest of the team uh, as coming up with great ideas being there to like reject something that is really bad that you know just doesn't fly and it, you know sometimes it was hard because you can't listen to all ideas from all places but the rest of the team was was really important also with vetting and trying and, and all sorts of these things so the affliction system is the hook of the game, um, and that, that's really what we call the whole system for your heroes being human and sometimes basically being a bunch of unruly toddlers. And that's built on events and situations. If you think about it, being an adventurer is a really, really terrible job. Um, you, you might be running out of food. You're in search of this elusive gold. It's kind of like startup culture. Um, you know, you're, you're in the, the dark running out of light, it could die at any moment. And so there's these events and situations that lead to stress. And uh, everyone loves to make fun of how you can read a book and it can just blow your mind in our game, but that's very Lovecraftian, to be fair. So stress builds on the heroes. Once it reaches 100, we have what's called a resolve check, and that, um, that's, that's a test of their mettle. And that resolves one of two ways. If you're lucky, they become virtuous, excuse me, like this courageous. But more often than not, um, they become afflicted. And then this manifests in their behaviors, in their stat, bonuses or penalties, and uh, narratively in the things they talk about. The inspiration for the affliction system was not games, really, uh, although I'm about to show an image. It was more, you know, human experience. Um, that's, that's fictional, you know, dr dramatizations, movies, TV shows, etc., but also just life. Being a manager, we talk about a lot. Uh, is, being a, you know, a, in, in a relationship with all, you know, all these things, your human experience, it's pretty easy to mine that for how we react to stress. Um, and, and that's a really important point is Darkest Dungeon is not a game about mental health or mental illness. Darkest Dungeon is a game about the human response to stress, and those are very different things. So this is an image, uh, I really like Band of Brothers Europe, obviously based on real events. And there's this character, Buck Compton, I think that, that's his name, played by this actor, Neil McDonough. And, you know, this great, he's, he's tall, he's handsome, he's tough. You know, he's been on a bunch of missions. He's kind of just this gregarious, energetic guy that's holding the squad together in a way. And they're in the Battle of the Ardennes and getting shelled through the winter. And, you know, he watches a shell land in a foxhole with a couple of his buddies. And they're just, they're just gone. It's like they're there one minute, the shell lands are gone. And he, there's this great scene where he just comes up and he, he just has the thousand-yard stare, shell shock, takes off his helmet, and he's just done. That's it. His war is over. And I think, like, that was really a moment that, you know, in a way we wanted to capture. There's always game over, man. Um, you know... <laughs> Hudson and his, you know, he's the most boisterous. I love watching, especially extended cut. I think there's even more talking him at the beginning, just being total boisterous asshole. And then, you know, of course, the minute things go to hell, he can't handle it. And Ripley is the one, you know, civilian that shouldn't be able to handle it and is made of steel. But war games and things have done morale for a long time, and to some degree, what we were doing is bringing a morale system into um, into an RPG. And so these aren't necessarily new ideas, it's just kind of maybe packaging them in a different way. The affliction system had seven afflictions, four virtues. And one of the neat things is that we have 15 different character classes in the game, and we've got custom strings and multiple variants for every single class, every single affliction, virtue, every single act out they can do. You know, that's one of the things we really invest a lot in and paying out. I think the game has about 70,000 words of text now. And that's funny for a lower list game with no dialogue trees. Um, so it snuck up on us. And if you play the game, you know, they, they say, it might be a little hard to see here, but here, um, the Hellions being masochistic is like, please cut me, I want this. Um, here, I think the uh, Highwaymen's being abusive and basically berating his party members. And this, well, this is too hard to see. It's a little small. You know, more of the, more of the same. Someone made some fan art, which captures the feeling you get in the game a lot. Um, if you can't read it, can you people hold your shit together and hit something for five minutes, please? 
Um, that happens a lot. But so the important thing about the affliction system is it's really the hook of the game. I mean, you know, the game is is universally lauded for a lot of things, but this is kind of always there. And, and if you know, if it didn't work, the whole game premise falls down. And it's built up of really pretty simple subsystems. And we purposefully obfuscate part of that. When, you're, when your character is masochistic, we don't tell you what could happen. We don't tell you exactly what act outs they might do or how they might you know, run to the front or reject healing. We want you to discover that through play. We don't want to have a tooltip or a, as much as I love tooltips. Chris knows I love tooltips. Um, never met a tooltip I didn't love. Uh, but at, at the same point here, the, uh, we don't want to show you everything. We need, want you to discover it. But it's really important that stress, we could not. And we thought about it. We, we toyed around with obfuscating stress. But then, you know, we could have the characters talk as they're getting more stressed, like, hey, I'm getting stressed. But then you never really know where the breaking point is. And you can't make any tactical or strategic decisions of how far to press or what to do or when to, you know, camp if you don't know. So it actually worked out really well to just make it like a health meter. Uh, we worried it would be a little boring, a little dry. But that, that certainly enhanced the game, certainly enhanced the systems. You know they're about to break. And that was really important. Affliction system also features the loss of agency, which I'll talk about a little more. Yeah, it worked. And I mean, that's, that's why I say it's something that went well. And I think one of the biggest reinforcements to me that it worked was during early access, which we were in for roughly a year, we made very, very few changes to the affliction system. I mean, frighteningly few. We thought we would go back and we would add a million more act outs and we would you know, double back on some things that were really rough. And, you know, other than a little bit of tuning and maybe improving the flow of a few things, like I think now, like if they balk the heal, you go to heal them and they balk, we, we don't penalize you your turn. Uh, you, they don't get the heal, but you can still use that character. Uh, we made a couple changes like that, but in general, we didn't. And the reason we didn't is because the community was very clear of many other things that they didn't like. <laughs> or, or, you know, and I think that's important, though. You know, the squeaky wheel gets the grease a little bit because this was working, and I think it realized the potential of what the affliction system was supposed to do. As you've seen with the Ezekiel video, uh, we successfully not only made your heroes afflicted, we made the game players afflicted. I'm, how many of you have rage quit Darkest Dungeon? I'm, I don't know if I should ask this. <laughs> how many of you rage quit but came back and played again? Thank God. Okay. How many of you rage quit and are never going to play it again but still came to the talk anyway? <laughs> Thank you for your honesty. What's that? Thank you. Thank you for the honesty. I have met people that are like, I like the game, I can never play it, I will never play it again. And, um, but it may help you a little bit in your, in your hearts to know that we also made ourselves afflicted a lot. Um, through development, we developed a vernacular vocabulary for understanding how stress was impacting us, and actually you should try it on your teams, it works quite well. Uh, so, you know, we, we would see that, hey, you know, maybe don't talk to them today, they're, they're really close to afflicted. Or, you know, someone would send a nasty email and, and then, you know, we'd get on the side. Don't worry, they're, they're just abusive right now. They'll, they'll get over it. Um, and, you know, to put myself out there, my affliction is irrationality. As my stress builds and builds and builds and then I become triggered, then I'll pick some really stupid thing to just panic about. Um, and maybe, you know, just, yeah, coffee or I don't know what it is. Uh, or make some small point about the game that I want to fight tooth and nail about that's completely meaningless. So that's me. A little bit about, this is just to show, like, uh, this is what we call the trait library, which is, this is how the afflictions are actually hooked up. This isn't particularly sexy, but what, what you can see there, and, you know, these slides will be on the, on the vault later, is, is like a series of buffs to the stats, and then situational uh, act-outs is what we call them. Like, hey, there's this chance of, if it's your turn in combat and you're abusive, you might do this. Or, you know, if it's a reaction act out, if someone tries to heal you and you're uh, paranoid, you may reject it because you think they're trying to kill you. That kind of stuff. And this brings me to one of my favorite things, the, the Microsoft Excel. Um, and uh, uh, I think you were saying Ed Freeze said hello. And, like, Ed Freeze, you know, was head of Microsoft Games. I like to think of him because he worked on Excel. That's... That's his best accomplishment. So anyway, um, Excel is my, my favorite thing. <laughs> Excel is huge. And not Google Sheets, I will add. Google Sheets are like, for collaboration, I'll use it, but Excel is, is the thing. Um, Excel, you know, when you're a small team, you need to figure out ways to move faster. And one of these sheets is, is uh, the monster library. There's like, I don't know, 200 
uh, 200 monster files or something, and that that was really useful to automate that. And so, you know, usually things made their way from Spreadsheet into a JSON or Darkest. So it's not like we had the best pipeline ever, but uh, you know, the programmers were busy doing important things um, and making the game. But but we had enough to get through, and so that's where I think the VBA exporters and things like this. We're, we're so helpful, um, you know, especially when you're a small team. So setting up these parametric equations so that, um, you know, you can you can decide all monsters in the whole game need a little more health, and you don't have to go through. And you know, I'm a big fan of formulas, obviously. So a lot of that went well, but there's definitely some gaps where we're missing uh, missing key exporters that I always thought you know we'd find time to make and, and never did. So there were still like it became a little confusing working with programmers because you know we'd, we'd make a change for a new feature and then it'd be like, is this an exported file or a hand edited file? I don't know. I got to look through my 27,000 spreadsheets, and then um, you know so that sometimes led to problems. Something that went well is our bad design. Um, so there's a few areas of bad design that I want to focus on. So loss of agency, that's one. Uh, so in other words, your characters do things that you don't want them to do. Uh, they pass their turns, they reject healing, they basically just make your life difficult. Yeah, in talking to my partner Chris, it does sound like maybe being a parent um, and you know, or, or owning a pet. And that's kind of what they are. And that, generally, that's bad design um, because you know that you should get f positive feedback for the actions you do, uh, et cetera, et cetera. But it was very, very important for Darkest Dungeon that um, that you were not in control. I mean, that, that's really just like a founding principle. And so, even though we knew it frustrated the heck out of you sometimes, like in the Ezekiel video, you know, it came to one of the, one of his characters' turns. I think they passed, and then of course he lost the whole had a party wipe. Um, but this was necessity from the heroes are human um, idea. This made it a little hard sometimes because Dark's Dungeon has a lot of numbers and a lot of systems and it's kind of a tactics, it's a turn-based combat game. And so how do you, you know, sometimes you're worried about balance, like, hey, this, this character has like, its DPS is like, you know, undersized by 5% compared to the other characters. And then you have this system in the game that basically can just rob you of a turn entirely. And that was sometimes a hard balance to, to tread and to get people to expect. Because I think for some people, they, they genuinely enjoy Darkest Dungeon as just, you know, it would be really cool if not for this affliction system that keeps getting in the way. Like it's a turn-based, you know, neat turn-based combat, cool rogue, like whatever. And so that, w that was hard sometimes to balance because you, ultimately there is all this kind of stuff that's taking control away from you. Um, our save system, so if you're familiar with the game, it saves all the time. Uh, actions are permanent, there's no save scumming. I mean, you have to go through great lengths to do some save scumming. And so permanent consequences were, were what we were after. We want you at all moments to be like, should I go a little further? Maybe get a little more treasure? Do I think I can make to the end of this quest even though these two characters are afflicted and this one is almost dead? And to do that, you know, we, we needed this, this terrible save system that is just really, really mean. And it, it's exceptionally mean because in, in Ezekiel's video, he, you know, he crashed out of the game and I guess he calmed down the next day, came back to play booted it up, uh, and it had saved right before the hit that killed his characters, you know, because he, he crashed out. But it had already rolled, the, it had already rolled, and the action was, was fixed. So, you know, he's like, okay, we're going to do this. Can't, he had to watch it happen again. So, um, <laughs> that wasn't intentional. I mean, we did not make a use case for you crashing your computer and, and out. Um, 15 unbalanced hero classes. So we chose to do more heroes rather than less. And sometimes, you know, the, the cost of that was balance, uh, you know, and attention to each individual hero. But it was a conscious choice because every hero you add to the game gives the ability for more party formations and, um, you know, more, more interesting things. And we always thought of heroes as loot. Like when you go to the stagecoach, it should be exciting when you're waiting for a crusader and a crusader shows up. When you're waiting for a grave robber and a grave robber shows up. And it's funny to watch people uh, tweet about this because... You know, full disclosure, there's no crazy systems in that we detect what you want and then we don't give it to you or anything like that. Um, but, you know, some people are like, you know, I'm 20 weeks in and I haven't seen a goddamn hellion. Um, so, yeah, that's just, that's just roll of the dice. But it should be sort of exciting when, you're, when you really desperately need another plague doctor to fit, you know, to, because you lost one from your A-team and you need, you need to bring one back. And we made the conscious choice, though, of not to try to balance them all. Uh, this to varying degrees of success, but 
it wasn't just because it would be difficult. We actually wanted it to feel a little spiky, you know, like first edition D and D. Like it's crazy. Monks and um, you know, monks and magic users are basically just like babies in radio flyers that you have to pull around for the first couple levels, and then you know. But then by the time they get to level twelve, it's crazy. They're wiping out entire armies and um, that kind of stuff. And I think that spikiness is really fun. You know, sometimes there's this like crusade to balance the hell out of your game. And I think it really depends what you're trying to accomplish. If it, if it's a multiplayer, you know, it's Hearthstone, yes. Uh, if it's a single player RPG where, you know, you don't like Hellions or you don't like Highwaymen as much, it's, it's not a critical issue. And this, we even had conflict in the team on this. I mean, there was times that people kind of bring these things to me and I'm just like, I'm really not worried by that problem right now. And I think it was hard for people to understand, but it, it was a conscious choice of, I'm worried about the affliction system right now, or I'm worried about something else, not the Highwaymen's DPS. And also I think something that's forgotten is that characters are the sum of, of their entire usage throughout the game, in particular combat and camping. And so a lot of times, again, to reference DPS, we're like, this character's DPS is too low. And, well, what about their camping skills? You know, what about their versatility? What about their range of skills and where they can be positioned in, in, the, uh, in the party and things like that? And there were, there were plenty of times where a character was underpowered across the board and uh, not intentionally. And so we did, you know, that early access was great for that. But I, I think a lot of times people look at the immediate usage of something and, and not the not kind of the entire the entirety. Another thing that was really bad about what we did, but good, was everybody's favorite Lord and Savior, R and Jesus. <laughs> we have a lot of R and Jesus in the game, um, a lot of variants, a lot of variants, intentionally so to you know which is not always great, but. If you make all the right choices in Darkest Dungeon, you plan, you assemble a great team, you are experienced, you pick the right quest, you et cetera, et cetera, we want you still to get your ass kicked sometimes, basically. Uh, now, I want to be clear, we don't have an AI director system, so similar to what I was talking about the stagecoach, we don't have something that detects you're doing well and then we swoop in and make it harder for you. We just rely on the beauty of R and Jesus and variants. Um, the Darkest Dungeon is poker. Poker... Everyone has bad beats in poker if you play poker. And oddly enough, everyone's bad beat story is exactly the same. It's just told differently. I was winning. I should have won. I didn't. Um, and we want you to experience those in Darkest Dungeon. We don't want to... Like, the tuning part, the craftsmanship, the design is how often, right? How often do we, you know, do we want you to experience that two-thirds of the time? No. If you prepared and planned and took the right party group into the right dungeon and, you know, provisioned appropriately and didn't, you know, grab every bookcase in Iron Maiden if you didn't have the right stuff for it, uh, you should do well. But every once in a while, things go badly. And we want to put you in that uncomfortable space of... I should be winning right now. This is getting away from me. Do I run? You know, do I abandon? Do I change my plan? Or do I hang in here and push through? And there's a couple, uh, you know, this can go a variety of different ways. Maybe you make that gut check and you hang in there and you win. And that should be a moment that you, you love the game. Um, you should also applaud yourself for having the self-control to retreat and go back to town and lick your wounds. And I think that it's hard to communicate that, and that's why we put that first screen up when I showed you, like, Darkest Dungeon is about making the most of a bad situation. We're conditioned to play where you expect success, especially in the last few years with mobile games and things. You expect success, and it's really just a matter of solving the problem to get there. And if you don't have success, you reload and, and, and try and try again until you get there. And we fundamentally want to change that. And sometimes I think it's hard to communicate that to players, that they'll buy the game, and then this will happen. It's just like, what have I gotten into? And... The game is not intended for everyone, um, and that, that's something that you know, we, I, I think went well, but it also caused us an amount of grief as well. Another thing that, you know, on my role of just, of our role of just doing things that you shouldn't do, um, we, you know, in our final boss, so I'm going to show a little bit from the final boss, so if you don't want to see it, cover your eyes, um, if you're still working your way through the game. And I'm pressing not to explain it. Mother and mother, Alpha and Omega. Our and our destroyed. the heart of the world. Come on to your maker. Whoa.
Whoa. What are we? I'm not going to die. I'm not going to die. I'm not going to die. So, yes, we did just completely kill a character that had raised to level six with no death's door, no nothing. We just took them away. Um, you know, and you, by that time, you probably put, I don't know, 10 hours in that character, maybe a little more, who knows. Uh, hopefully it wasn't, well, actually, if it was Rain Oliver Dismiss, that's maybe all the more meaningful, uh, the tutorial characters, of course. Um, so, yeah, that's a terrible design decision. Like, that's a rage-inducing thing. Um, but we're so happy we did it. We couldn't be happier, actually. And it, it, there's a whole, I don't know if you got a chance to see Chris, uh, Chris's talk yesterday on the creative direction of the game, but that was really important in paying off this cosmic horror and the overall narrative. And when that goes up on the ball, I encourage you to check that out. He'll talk more about that battle. But we wanted you to experience that final battle in a specific way. And Darkest Dungeon has been about loss the whole time. And so, yeah, we're a little cheap, and we make you remember that even more uh, during the final battle. I'm going to kind of get a little faster through some of these so we can uh, go through. Another thing that was pointed out very often to us of our poor design here was healing versus damage. Healing it, it does not keep, like, the amount of healing, the numerical values do not keep uh, pace with the amount of damage you receive. And, you know, that was repeatedly reminded to us. And we were like, awesome, by design. So, yeah, the, the quests are a battle of attrition. The longer you go, eventually your character should die and become afflicted and stressed out. And the whole game is about, can you get to the end of the quest before that happens? Or how much loss are you willing to stomach? If this is your favorite character, are you going to, I think, what do they call it, gold breaking it or whatever, where you know you, people always want their guys fully healed, don't want to make any risk. So you could get one third in a dungeon and be like, screw this, I'm out. Um, whereas other people are like, I'm willing to lose two heroes to get through this. Even Ezekiel, you know, when he lost that third hero, he held it together pretty well. He knew he was trying to kill the necromancer and it was worth sacrificing characters. He only lost it when double death blowed at the end, which to be fair, I think would do it to anybody. And so one of the things that worked really well in the game is just breaking some rules. Um, you know, the save one is the one I always come back to. The way I love to play games, I like permissive save systems. Who are you to tell me how I you know, should and shouldn't save my game? But when we talked about Darkest Dungeon, we realized that would not work. It would rob the player of the experience that we intend them to have. And that, that was an interesting thing to be advocating and fighting for something that you don't even agree with normally. You agree with it for this game. And I think that's a really important point. You should never lose sight that you are designing for that game, not all games or rules of thumb or like make sure you never do this. So break the rules. I'm going to kind of hustle through this. Combat is interesting. Uh, we, we didn't end up at this, at this exact orientation initially. We were going to do kind of an Ultima style, um, top down, maybe 2D. At least that's what I was really interested in at first. We were very inspired by the, this classic age, Bard's Tale. I think you can see the DNA. In the old Bard's Tale, it would be like the first four characters can attack in melee. The next characters can attack in ranged. I think you see that in our system and that, um, you know, the positional requirements in some classes are definitely more geared towards melee attacks um, than others. Uh, this is a little more the art side, but the gold box games, Pularanians, I know we talked about how effective it was. They just had an idol and, a, and an attack. You know, they sit there, and then they just go... Tick. And, you know, I mean, not to undersell the amazing freaking art that these guys did. Uh, you know, but we're not a game that's fully, in, you know, animated with all these crazy... Uh, they made the most of, of kind of a light amount of assets, although a ton amount of work, I, I will add, um, before they kill me. They're eyeing me right now. It makes me nervous. Uh, th th we did a lot of uh, visual prototyping. This is something that uh, worked well working with Chris. This sometimes saved us having to like code things up or make things and try them. We, we would kind of, he would sketch stuff out. We would talk about the system, kind of mock up what it might look like, find the holes in that. And, and I think that was helpful. Here's an example of realizing, hey, not only with this new system and the slots, but you know, we can have characters that are bigger. He was working out, you know, what poses might be required, you know, trying to figure out tool tips, <laughs> which is, I, should, I think at one point I was, you guys nicknamed me tool tip or something, I don't know. And it ended up like this, and 
I think combat is something that has really served the game well. Probably one of the biggest unknowns of combat for me was, is will there, will there be enough depth in this 1D system? And it was still something, honestly, I fought even up through the, the last dungeon, the cove. You know, it was starting to get like, okay, how many more like weird moves can I think of or status effects or ways to pay off this? But I, it held together and I think there was definitely enough depth to pay it off. So that, that was, that was good. And in particular, I think one subsystem of Death's Door that was effective was, was this, uh, or of combat, excuse me, was Death's Door. And this didn't start in there. You know, we were playing combat, and as you might imagine, without the Death's Door mechanic, so the Death's Door mechanic essentially means you can't be killed in one blow. So without Death's Door, you might be sitting at two-thirds health, someone gets a crit, your, your character's dead. And with permadeath, that's crazy. Like, you can never be safe. Even at full health, you can never be safe. And we didn't want it like that, because then that, that robs you of all the... the you're either tense all the time, or you're never tense because you're just like, we're all, are, all already dead, so what does it matter? Uh, so in this case, you know, a damaging attack, the most it can do is reduce you to death's door, and then you have potentially a chance to heal or do something to that character um, you know, before, before they die. Now, you can still die, obviously, because sequences of events, uh, you know, you might not get a turn in between, your hero may be afflicted, the, the character you're trying to heal may be afflicted, etc. You may have not brought healers. So, you know, there's plenty of death, but this death door, I think it's like, for such a simple system, it's been so effective in, in raising the tension. I, I love that, those moments where your character goes to death's door and you're nervous and you're confronted with the loss, should I retreat, should I try to heal? And that's worked out really well. Narration, you know, is, is huge. Uh, we, we brought this narrator in for our announcement trailer. I don't think at that point we had even thought about using one in the game, but he was so amazing. Uh, Chris had found these Lovecraft audiobooks read by Wayne June. We contacted Wayne June, got him to read for a trailer, and it was just like, okay, he's in the game. We have to put him in the game. There's, there's no way we can't. Um, a little side tidbit is uh, Red Hook is named after the story, Horat Red Hook. Uh, so we're not in Brooklyn, uh, which this could, you know, I wish I would have thought of that before. People are like, oh, we're right next to each other. Mm-hmm. We're in Vancouver. But we just thought Red Hook sounded cool. Uh, it, it's kind of a classic story of like, you know, power and corruption. Um, not maybe the best in terms of Lovecraft's cultural sensitivities. So in retrospect, we feel bad for, for naming it after that story, but Red Hook sounds cool. So it's really, yeah, just this quote, the narrator has done so much. And by remarkability, I mean, I mean just virality of the game, people talking about it and things like that, aside from its quality. And it, this happens all the time. It's crazy. You post a trailer, and it'll just be strings of comments of, of the narrator lines, you know, or Reddit posts, or, it, it, you know, Twitch channels. And that's really fun to see. Even pop in places that aren't Darkest Dungeons, someone will say one thing, and it'll just go. And audio as a whole worked really well. I mean, this is a design talk, but the reason I want to mention it is it reinforces the gameplay experience. Um, if any of you do play racing games without the sound on, I don't understand you, um, because I think they're a lot more fun with the sound on. And it's not just enhancing, like, the experience. It's, it's enhancing the game design, um, which I'm grateful for. Narration here is just, uh, this is where I started to block out, like, where should he speak? What should he talk about? What kinds of things should he say? Um, and just wanted to play a couple lines. The human mind. Fragile. Like a robin's egg. There can be no hope in this hell. No hope at all. Grievous injury. Palpable fear. More dust. More ashes. More disappointment. (laughs) On that note of disappointment a good time to switch into the other side of the talk. Um, on the narration side, I want to say, yeah, Wayne's awesome. Power up mastered the lines and did the effects. Um, Chris and I did writing. Chris did most of the writing. And like some of the lines yeah, are just really fun to see. And you know, I think even recently someone's like, where's the trinkets and baubles line? I haven't heard that in a while. We're like, I don't know. It's like a bug. But someone remembered the line so well, they were very upset it wasn't playing. Um, so I love just listening to it. And then uh, I think for, for Give Me One Time Power Up had Wayne re- record some other th- other like joke lines for each of us, and it was it was really fun. So yeah, he's he's got that voice that sticks out. But yes, disappointment. So how many of you are familiar with the corpse? Uh, the corpse, the great corpse event. Okay, not that many. Okay, um, that's good. So we we pushed this during early access. We we pushed this amazing patch called the Hound and Corpse or Corpse and Hound or I don't know. 
Uh, it had all kinds of awesome stuff. The Houndmaster, sanitarium features, like new and awful diseases. Um, Steam Cloud Save, which is kind of cool, but not as cool as diseases. Corpses in combat. See, we were so excited about it. It was even a bullet point. And this is going to be a, real, a little relevant here, but if you remember the end of The Dark Knight, where um, basically things start going poorly for Batman. Batman takes a lot of, a lot of blame for some things. Um, leading up to the corpse and hound. So we launched early access on February 3rd of last year. And, you know, it, it did, I mean, there's no two bones about it. It did far better than we thought it was going to do. You know, we, we were just, we were launching into a climate of early access really being looked down upon. Um, you know, there had been some kind of high profile, maybe disappointments. And, you know, there was even this whole early access was dead. You know, everyone likes to proclaim the death of the next thing. So early access is dead, you know, and we're like, okay, we're about to launch. Um, you know, and we launched into that environment. I mean, we put our best foot forward. We delayed because in the fall, we originally wanted to launch early access. It wasn't ready. We delayed. Honestly, we were all running extremely thin on our personal runways. And, um, you know, that, that we kind of had to launch there. We were like, all right. Um, but we had no idea it was going to be received so well, to be honest. Um, and I think you could ask, well, actually, Kier. Kier thought it was going to be received well. The rest of us were nervous as hell. Um, a month later, my dad died. So I went from the highest high of my professional life, no question, to the lowest low of my personal life. I'm um, grateful he got to see the launch. Um, I got to share with him how that was going. Um, but when you're a small team, you know, and any one discipline that is taken out of action, your whole team is, is derailed. I mean, not, everybody's not taken out of action, but how are you going to push a patch that incorporates all disciplines uh, when one person is out of action? This is my dad in his natural environment. Um, so we had planned this Fiends and Frenzy patch, which was our first you know, real big non-like support update. And originally it was probably going to try to go in March or April, but you know, that didn't happen. I was kind of out of commission for a while. And so we, we uh, pushed it in May, and it was received pretty well. I think, um, yeah, and things have been just rolling, you know. So the Corpse and Hound was really, though, our first time, because the Fiends and Frenzy had been pre-planned in a way, like we knew what content, and aside from some gameplay tweaks, um, it, it was sort of preloaded. And the Corpse and Hound was the first chance to really, like, collect, collect info from the community and step back and go, what game systems are not working, what's not working the way we want, what can we do? And one of the things, uh, it technically wasn't in the Corpse and Hound, it came in Fiends and Frenzy was... Um, or around that time was, was heart attacks. So what had happened is the players that were getting good at the game could do these dark runs. They would basically push their team to full affliction, um, and they realized that the afflictions were not incapacitating it so far that your team couldn't function, and so they just stopped caring about stress or torchlight or anything, and they would just go, they would just go run these people through. And that that definitely wasn't the feeling we want in Darkest Dungeon. We want you always to feel in a precarious situation. And so the heart attack system came into play, which basically was at 100, you, you have your affliction check, and, and then that resolves. But stress continues to build. You have a little bit of a shock absorber there. But if you get to 200, and it's the smiley face, you're dead. No warning. Um, it filled a, a very important gameplay role, a very important role in terms of what we were trying to get you to experience. And at the time, actually, you know, there was a little bit of, you know, a little bit of like, oh, this is a little rough, but not general, not outcry. So then in the Corpse and Hound, we did Corpses, which, which was, was very important too. So what you see here in this uh, screen image is a corpse uh, in the front there. And so there had been a dominant strategy, the, the, you know, the table saw strategy, which is focus fire everything on the first enemy, um, take them out, and then that collapses everybody forward. And the, the enemies in back, generally, they, they, just like heroes, had skill prerequisites. So if you're an archer in the back, you get collapsed forward, you can't use your, uh, you can't use your attack. And so um, it, it was just too strong to, to focus fire in the front, and it, it kind of reduced the rest of our combat system to maybe irrelevance in terms of like positioning, ranged attacks, debuffs, buffs, etc. So the corpse is the way they work. You, you kill the enemy, they leave a corpse, it remains there, they hold their formation, they don't collapse forward, and uh, the corpse will eventually go away, or you can spend some extra actions or resources to, to eliminate it. And this enhanced, this did a lot of things. It fixed the dominant strategy, it enhanced the systems that we had built, and we thought it did so thematically. Uh, we didn't implement it as, uh, up to our usual standard, and that's partially for reasons I'll get to, in terms of like, 
you know, usually we, we try to blow you away visually, um, and this was no fault of the artists. We, you know, it was, it was a gameplay experiment in a way, so every corpse looked the same. We didn't have custom corpses per enemy and things like that. And also, we had thought of a lot of other ideas, or at least I had, in terms of we could buff up the front rank enemy, melee enemies to generally be a lot tougher, these sorts of things. Um, so it was better than the other design options. Oh, yeah. Well, I thought people were going to love it. They lost their minds. <laughs> um, it's, it's really hard to overstate how much they lost their minds. It's definitely, I mean, at least for me, but I think Chris would agree, it's the hardest thing we've had to deal with on the game. Um, and we've had a lot of challenges on the game. And hardest probably just emotionally. Uh, it, it splintered our community, which had been big and growing and excited. And generally, or really, we had had it very, very good. It was very positive. Everything had been received well, generally. you know, And people were kind of patiently waiting for us to plug some holes in the game. Um, it created this changing wave of sentiment, and it was an easily told story, this promising game gone bad. That wasn't fun to look at, at Steam, uh, look at you know, the helpful reviews, and see literally four pages of nothing but negative. Um, this is a whole story in itself, but this also coincided with people that were not just unhappy that we had added this into the game, but that decided that we were basically the most terrible people on the face of the planet, and remain to believe that way uh, today. And I think this narrative versus truth was hard for us because what I mean by that is people who played the game and said, I, didn't, I don't like the corpses, also, you know, that's, we respect that opinion. Um, people are like, I heard they ruined the game. You know, it's like, well, where did you hear that from? That was tough because we were, we were also, you know, still continuing to develop the game and, and we had been excited by how well the game had been received. This patch launched in July and uh, I remember thinking, you know, people are going to be, they're going to, Grouse a little bit, it's a big change, but then they'll get used to it. And I was in Colorado, so my, my father had been cremated and went back to Colorado, where we're from, to, to intern him and, you know, be with family, etc. And, you know, this is a few months later after he died. And I remember it was either the night before we were going to bury him or the night after, Chris calls me up and we're having this talk and he's like, it's getting really bad. Like, I don't know what to say. Like, they're not, they're not getting used to it. They're starting, you know, it, the community is blowing up. Um, it was it was a tough it was a tough time, and this is one way to illustrate it. Um, in July, we were really lucky to have uh, you know a very popular website that serves a lot of gamers that are exactly the sort of gamers that we want to reach. Um, they put us in this top 50 RPGs of all time. I mean, these are like games like Ultima are on there, and it was this huge honor. They're like, this is the only early access game that's even on this list, and this was just like yeah, it was it was hard to overstate our excitement of that. That was July, and we pushed the Corpse and Hound patch. This was August, from the same publication. So what, you know, I'm fully afflicted at this point, for sure. Um, you know, just pegged at, at like 190 stress. And uh, we didn't have our death door mechanic and the heart attack thing yet, so that was rough. Um, and I, I kept hinging on these three words, a sad fate. I mean, when I read that, something just clicked in my head. You know, that just, it was just hard to even comprehend. Because we were still in early access. And we had been this example of an early access game done right. Um, and now basically we were being left for dead on the roadside. Like they, they, they took this great game and they drove it into a concrete pillar. Um, you know, and I couldn't get over fate. Like we're still, we're still working on the game here. And this fundamentally changed my view of early access. I'm super pro early access for the record. I would happily do it again. Uh, I think we're just, we know more what to expect. But, I thought early access would be a time to experiment with gameplay mechanics. And I don't know that that's really true. Um, especially if your game's already working, that's rough. If your game's not working, I think you have the onus, you know, you need to improve it. But massive changes to people that have already bought your game, is a, it's a tough, it's a thorny problem. It's even ethical. They paid for the game, now you're changing it. You know, that, that's hard. Um, so Chris and I spent a lot of time uh, talking, a lot of time talking, a lot of Google Hangouts, some drinking, um, some pity parties, some anger, you know, the full range of emotions. And, but what it always came down to is, did we do the right thing? And I remember just thinking like, okay, like guys just laid on me, just tell me, did I, you know, was this a horrible mistake? Because corpses were my idea and I had sold it up through the team. Uh, you know, just tell me, I don't care, I'll eat crow, whatever it is, I just want to make the game right, you know. And I was losing my ability to see objectively. So it was great, because Chris and I spent a lot of time switching positions, devil's advocate, all these discussions about what to do. 
Meanwhile, we have this community management crisis. It's not like we have time to just do this calmly and, you know, et cetera. And one thing that was also relevant is just the psychology of, of change. I mean, in other organizations, it's a whole field of study, change management. You know, some of you may be familiar. People don't like change. There's, you know, who moved my cheese and all that. And not to throw a team member under the bus, but, you know, one thing that had been in my mind before we did this change is that, you know, combat had been working and, and Chris and, and Pierre worked to add this combat camera, which is like, it fakes it to look like 3D, if you notice in the game, um, that it like sways to look like 3D. Anyway, I remember put in and one of the guys on the team saw it and said, I think this is verbatim, this is the worst fucking thing I've seen in my entire life. <laughs> a week later, two weeks later, I was like, this is cool. So I thought that would happen with corpses. Um, so it, it, the long story short, and I got to hustle because I wanted to leave a little time for, um, for Q&A, is that uh, we decided it was right for the game. It, it was the right from mechanical decision. It was the right thematic decision. We stood by it. Um, you know, that, that's, of course, a hard decision to make, and we respect the opinions of, of, of people that disagree. So we're in this weird dilemma of do we remove this and make what we consider a worse game to make people happy? And... Um, this is something that got us through the next six months. I'm gonna hurry through here, but you know, Chris kept bringing it up. Like, things had gone so well for us, to be honest. It's like, at some point, you're gonna make a mistake, or you're gonna, you know, that you have to fall off the peg. And um, this was hard. I mean, I say fast forward six months, but the last six months up till launching January was pretty rough. I mean, we're sitting here and going, is the final story on Darkest Dungeon going to be a promising game that was ruined? And living with that uncertainty, I think, is instructive just because you'd think we'd be riding high on the early access to sex. No, we're riding high on, like, what's the legacy of the game, or riding low on what's the legacy of the game going to be? Fast forward, I think, an interesting part of change management is ultimately the changes were received well, and even people that had expressed concern in July when they reviewed the game, uh, they're like, I see why they did this. And so that, that was good. What got us through is just holding to that creative vision and um, investing in more community management. I mean, these are things we did wrong. We didn't invest in community management up front. Um, we were too precious about how to present the game to people and force our way of playing it down their throats, so we added toggle options, and I think that's something that we needed to do, and, you know, and we learned from this experience. And it also reminded us that DD, you know, we, we'd always said DD is not a game for everyone, and this reminded us that that was the case. So that's the, the key learning about early access. Um, content is always good. I think that, you know, substantive gameplay changes, you want to have community management in place, you want to warn them of the changes, we do this better now. Hey, this is coming down the line. Just beware of this. What do you think about this? We push it in a, in a beta branch, let people try it out. And, you know, that, that was stuff we really learned. A few other things I'm going to skip through, and then this will leave just a couple minutes for questions. Uh, the bold points are what I want to emphasize. Other things, we have a lot of grind in the game. We didn't even add the end game until full launch, and so we didn't get the benefit of tuning that through early access, so we're doing that tuning now. And, you know, certainly I think one of the things we've been repeatedly deemed on is, is this grind. We like a consequence, but losing your full level six heroes and having to rebuild, it just causes some people to just throw the game away. We don't want that, so we've been doing some things to help, help with those. Exploration was a really tough design mechanic. I, I still believe like we haven't totally paid off. You know, the walking and the quests and the curios. Uh, in particular, the game started. It was this auto walk. You just they kind of walk down the hall and then things happen. It was terrible, and we almost were going to restructure all of all of exploration. When we made it active, it just made it so much better. So that was something that we spent a lot of time spinning our wheels on. Um, everybody's favorite mechanic, hunger. It's not that we can't improve it. It's just that we're you know. It did enough, and after the corpse thing, quite frankly, we're like, if we make a hunger system and it's worse, oh man. Uh, the jostled free, we had these events where you'd, <laughs> everyone loves jostled free, where we had these events where you'd be walking down, like, kind of, and pull an event card and something would happen. One of them was this jostled free. It's like, hey, you're walking down the hallway and something falls out of your pack. And uh, it just, can you imagine the rage? And just like, your nice trinket just literally just took it away randomly. And so this, this, this was really good because it, it brought up what we call the jostled free rule. Is, you know, we, we do a lot to you, but don't arbitrarily with no, you know. Another way of saying it is, is this. <laughs> um, 
yeah, never fully, count, you know, it's like go get the 20 wolf pelts. Um, there was a lot of stuff that, that we could have done. I'm going I'm to skip right through here because I want to have a couple minutes for questions. Sorry. In the end, fortunately, the dungeon isn't too dark. Here's some of the stuff. I want to say about retention. We're not, we didn't design with retention in mind, but the interesting thing about it is just that it's a sign of do people come back and play more? And that's important to us. When you played it and started it, do you come back the next day because you want to play again? And that, you know, mobile, PC, whatever, that's, that's hugely important. Um, more than all those things is we feel like we made the game we set out to make, and that feels good. Um, we were ready to live or die by that vision, and I'm really, you know, we're, we're incredibly grateful that people have enjoyed it. A little bit about what's coming. We're not done. We're still pushing some features. So we're coming to other platforms. We're going to enable modders, stuff like that. And this is news to even the Red Hook team. Today, I'm happy to announce game number two from Red Hook Studios. Brightest kittens. <laughs> All right, we got a, a couple minutes for questions, and then afterwards, uh, you know, we'll move out. We'll probably get kicked out in a minute. We have five minutes. Okay, great. What time period does the game take place in? Uh, this, yeah, we, we, we narrowly refine the time period to uh, roughly 500 AD to 900, or 1800 AD. <laughs> yeah. No, it, it really is. I mean, you've got the Hellion, which is kind of a, almost a Pictish, you know, a barbarian on up to the highwayman with his, you know, little scarf and, and pistols. And... Yeah, we, that's kind of part of our lore is, you know, we, we, we wanted it, or the Crusader and his, you know, heavy metal armor on the way up to the Musketeer. So, yeah, we, we purposefully kind of have created this alternate universe that isn't super defined there. Thank Can you. Can you uh, speak to the level clamping that was done where the high-level characters are no longer able to go on the low-level journeys and what reinforced that decision? Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, so what he's talking about is basically we, we as, as your characters level up, we prevent you from taking them on lower-level quests and, and you know, power-leveling your younger heroes. Uh, it's not it's not super popular all the time, but the bottom line is if you can do that, the game is robbed of its tension. And, you know, this is kind of like maybe something that isn't incredibly eloquent from a design perspective. We're kind of hitting you on the head with a hammer. But it was absolutely critical to make sure that we keep you in this risk um, thing. So we loosely justify it and say, you know, as they level, level up, they get big heads. And they're like, I don't want to waste my time down in your, you know, like you, you're the FNGs. You guys go on your mission. I'm, I'm sticking with the experienced guys. I think even Band of Brothers had kind of a, a cool thing like that where they're like, as they, you know, as they progress, they're just like, the new recruits would come and they're like, don't talk to them, they're new. If they've lived through a couple of missions, then we'll talk to them. But, you know, we, we're not able to express that. So, uh, but it's ultimately because we want you in a position of risk in the game. And th if we let you do it, you can just grind your way through the game and actually not be tense. And then we'd rather have you have fun and be tense than, like, succeed and, and not be tense. Thank you. Uh, hi. First of all, thank you very much for the talk. It was really great. Uh, I'm not sure for what it's worth. Uh, I think you made the right call. I think the game that you wanted to make, all your decisions to go towards that in the community will probably get used to it eventually. Um, as far as the question, uh, you mentioned that when you were in early access, a lot of the uh, stuff that you changed obviously was on the corpse stuff. Um, what was some other stuff that you changed during early access and uh, did any of it like surprise you? Yeah, I mean, we, we did a lot of you know hero changes based on feedback. Um, a lot of stuff we had planned out. You know, we knew we were going to make the new dungeons, things like that. I mean, I think one thing we changed in the sanitarium was uh, we split treatment into diseases and quirks. We allowed the ability to lock uh, lock quirks in, and also if some negative quirks could could become permanent, and then those would cost more to unlock. So I think that was like really necessary to pay off that system more, and that you know that wasn't something we knew exactly up front. Uh, I'm trying to think of, of some other things. Uh, you know, more mechanics. Every hero that we tried to put in, we tried to usually do a new mechanic. I mean, the Howmaster had his pet and the dog treats. Uh, the the Man-at-Arms had the repost. And so that was really fun because, and also challenging because every time we added a new mechanic, we're like, oh man, I wish we could retrofit this through the whole game. And we weren't always able to do that. And I think it's one reason that a lot of people like the Cove monsters the best mechanically because, you know, they came the latest and we were able to make full use of, of all the, you know, the whole palette at that point. Um, so oftentimes in design, you run into situations where parts of the game feel like they're fighting themselves. Uh, like, for instance, I just kind of, you talk a lot about creating the human connection with the units. Um, 
But then also, like, because you get such a large supply of them, it's almost better for as a player to not connect with them so you don't get all tilted when they die. Similarly, you, you talked a lot about how you put so much effort and work into the affliction system where the players spend most of their time trying to avoid afflictions. Mm -hmm. They spend a lot of the time trying to avoid stress altogether. Yeah. So how do you kind of deal with that as a designer, figuring out where to kind of draw the line? of what's helping and what's hurting. Some of it we intentionally don't totally draw a line. The hero, the hero one, for example, and Chris talked about this a little bit yesterday in his talk, but uh, people play the game differently. So some people get very, very attached. They name their heroes. We encourage you to name your heroes after your friends and loved ones. <laughs> and, uh, and then when they die, you, know, you lose your mind. That's awesome. We love that. And then some people become very jaded, and they look at them as meat bags that are basically means to an end. And you know, they don't even name them, or they name them like you know, Crusader 2, II, Crusader 3. <laughs> Um, or sometimes, you know, a little bit like, you know, Baldwin 1, Baldwin 2. So they had a name originally and then they keep his lineage up. Um, <laughs> but a lot of people post, you know, I, I love reading these posts. They'll say like, this game, you know, I had these heroes, they're dead. I, I hate it. What am I doing wrong? I'm terrible at the game. And then people will say, okay, you're thinking this all wrong. You need to look at these. You need to just go in there. You need to run them to their desks until you get some money, dismiss them, pick a few select heroes to really invest in, let the other ones just, you know. And I, I love that interplay. There's no right way to do it. So there we let that kind of take care of itself. Um, as far as like the affliction system, yeah, that's hard because we want you to be afflicted. So the way, the way that's a balance issue that if I watch, you know, streams or get a lot of feedback that, man, people are just going through and they never get afflicted. I'm like, all right, that's a problem. We need to increase stress damage. You know, I want people to get afflicted. And so that, that's a game balance issue. Hi. Um, Hi. So speaking of naming characters after your family, <laughs> um, you mentioned high level characters dying and that being a really uh, big turnoff. I know the same thing happens in games like XCOM. Mm -hmm. um, was that something you didn't think you would be able to fix, or was it something that like um, reinforced that like hopelessness motif? Um, and in a, in a perfect world, would you add something that would help making uh, yeah. getting your feet back? Yes, so we just did actually. We just pushed something to help get your feedback um, last week. So now we have in the stagecoach, there's an upgrade tree that allows you to unlock the ability to hire higher level heroes. Um, and so that's really important. What, and then the, uh, what else? Uh, we increased the power leveling benefit from heroes that have been to the Darkest Dungeon, come back and, and have the never again trait. And so I would say that originally we wanted that sense of loss, but uh, one minute left. We wanted that sense of loss. But really, like, getting wiped on a full level six, no, that's too much. Like, it's too much if someone literally walks away and doesn't play the game again. Right. Uh, we want you to be angry for a night and then come back tomorrow and be victorious. And so I think we just kind of had to think of how to do that. And, you know, we're losing a level two hero is no big deal. Losing four level sixes is a big deal. So, yeah, we're actively trying to improve that. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, last, last question, I think. When should a game go early access? Ah, when it's ready. <laughs> I, my advice is wait as long as you can, uh, because early access, uh, we've now had a number of, of successes. And not, I mean, just there's been lots of good games in early access as well, and I think that people will always be receptive to more good early access games, um, but they will very quickly jump on games that are not fun, not buggy yet. So you really have to make those hard choices of you know, is this game ready for prime time? I, I think a game that fundamentally has its loop in place and is fun, but maybe out of balance and missing some content, that, that's where, like, if we do our next game, I think when we know it's fun, we don't know about the balance, and it's maybe, you know, 50% content complete, that might be a good time to launch. I think if you're like, let's throw it out there and see where it lands, I would do your own sort of private playtesting first, because it's really hard to come back from the perception that it's a bad game. All right, last, we'll sleep the last one. Who's on your A team? Uh, I don't play this game. It's too stressful. <laughs> uh, thank you very much. Uh, please uh, fill out your reviews. Uh, you know, when you get the email, it'd be great to know, and you know, maybe they'll invite me back again after Brightest Kittens.